The next step of the investigation is Midian. Mount Sinai was in the vicinity of this ancient land. Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, where he spends 40 years living as a shepherd with the priest of Midian named Jethro. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and he led his flock to the wilderness and came to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And this is really compelling. So he goes closer, and God says to him out of the burning bush, take your shoes off, you stand on a holy place. And that's when he tells Moses to go back to Egypt, tell Pharaoh to let the people go so that they can come back to this mountain with him where they will learn how to serve God. As I reviewed the text for myself, I began to see that the location of Midian would be central to the debate. The obvious implication is that since it was during Moses' stay in Midian that he encountered the burning bush at Sinai, the mountain must have been in or very near Midian. But where exactly was Midian? There's other indications that are historical of the location of Mount Sinai. One interesting one is found in an allegory by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. This allegory contrasts the outworking of the Mosaic law, the law of Moses received on Mount Sinai, versus the divine grace of the new covenant. Essentially, in the Old Testament, it was the law of Moses. The New Testament was the grace. And that's what Paul was writing about in these verses. But this allegory reads, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the old and the new, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. And that's referring to Hagar, the concubine of Abraham. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. I'm not it's almost gonna, like a puzzle, isn't it? Yes, I'm not going to get into the theology of the allegory, but I will say that this allegory is based on real geography. The real geography is the backbone of this allegory. If the geography is not real, the allegory fails. Mm -hmm. And there's actually wordplay on two Greek words we're going to look at, answereth and above, which are geographical words. There's actually wordplay on those. They're used here in the allegory answereth and above, but they also have geographical meanings. Now this, uh, I've seen this verse before. Is this King James? This is a King James, correct. Okay. Because it's a, little, it's a little bit old English, isn't it? Yes, and I've used this verse because it would be most familiar to the most people. Mm -hmm. But it is a little bit odd because Hagar is how we think of... So the, the point you're making is that uh, there's two covenants. One is at Mount Sinai, which is related to the Mosaic Law. Okay, and the other one is Jerusalem. So it's basically giving you two geographical uh, locations and a, a spiritual connection. Yes, it's, it's saying that the law is related to Mount Sinai in Arabia where it was given. And those who have left the law and gone to the New Testament grace are above in Jerusalem. And they're free. Okay. Y yes, because they're living in grace and not the law. What do you think this is actually communicating? Well, the first thing we have to do is identify what was Paul's Arabia. Mm -hmm. In his day, the Arabia he referred to was called Arabia Felix. That means the happy Arabia. And his idea of Arabia would be based on Old Testament passages because Paul was essentially trained as a, a Jewish scholar. And the first passage we look at is in 1 Kings 10 regarding the Queen of Sheba. Solomon received revenues from merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of territories. So 
the South Arabian kingdom of Sheba was within Arabia Felix. And if we look at a map in antiquity, the ancient geographer Ptolemy, writing in 150 AD, described Arabia Felix as beginning at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba at Aqaba and extending down into the Arabian Peninsula. It lay below this line and east of the Gulf. So this was Arabia Felix. This is the area that I believe the Apostle Paul was referring to when he said that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Now here's another example. In Isaiah, Dedan is cited. Dedan was clearly located in Arabia Felix. This is a prophecy against Arabia, your caravans of Dedanites who camp in the thickets of Arabia, etc. So based on Old Testament passages, the Apostle Paul would have thought of Arabia Felix as the part of Arabia in which Sinai was located. Looking at this map, it's a replication of Ptolemy's work circa 150 AD. Here's Jerusalem, and here is Arabia Felix. And it's, this would represent the head of the Gulf of Aqaba here, the head of the Red Sea. And then you see Arabia Felix lying east of that and below that. Mm -hmm. And the east-west dimensions here are, are wrong because of longitude problems in the time of Ptolemy. But it does show us that Arabia Felix was below Jerusalem and east of the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. Well, why is this then significant? Is that Paul would have had this understanding and he's trying to tell you something about where Mount Sinai is? I believe he assumed the reader would know where Arabia was. Mm -hmm. He said Mount Sinai in Arabia. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't go obviously into detail about that, but cranking back the clock, we would say that the most logical position would be Arabia Felix. And what's happening though is that in throughout then history, church history or Christian history, they've put the mountain over here in the Sinai. Exactly. And the Sinai meaning the east, what they thought was east. But what you're suggesting is that no, east is even further east than what you think. The mountain is further east than the Sinai Peninsula. It's over here. Yes, and to talk a little more about the geography of Moses, he referred to Yam Suf or the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the eastern arm of the Red Sea. He referred to that as a landmark east of Egypt. Now, once he was east of that landmark, what was he going to use for a, a direction? Well, he just said that this is a wilderness of east, or this is the mountain east of the east. Mm -hmm. Or if it was east or far east, right? Yes, so mm -hmm. he's basically saying, I'm not sure exactly where we are, but it's, it's east of Yam Suf, which was his main landmark, mm -hmm. and even farther east was the mountain. Very simplistic, but yet without having landmarks and uh, place names to go by, you really don't have a choice. Well, if you think about um, even different civilizations, this was the world that they knew, right? And they, they didn't go f too much further because they didn't know what was going to happen. Or, I mean, I'm not, I don't know how completely true my statement is in the fact that they didn't know what was there. But if they thought this was Far East, they hadn't traveled too far then to know that there's something even farther, right? Yes, and things were very nebulous. The measurements were poor. Mm -hmm. They were reports of travelers and military ventures. So it was a hodgepodge idea of what was going on geographically. Now, to Josephus, who wrote about the time of the Apostle Paul, he defined Arabia Felix as being east of the Red Sea and being the place where Midian was located. Mm -hmm. And, and so we have another hint there. If, if there's other hints that Mount Sinai was somehow related to Midian and Josephus is placing Midian east of the Red Sea in Arabia Felix, we have a triangulation there mm -hmm. on potential locations to look for. Okay. Now, we're going back to the allegory of, of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4. And what I've done is pulled out just the geographical statements. Mount Sinai in Arabia, we've shown where that is, answereth 
to Jerusalem, which is above. That's the geographical statement in the allegory. And the two Greek words that we need to look at are systoikio and anno. Mm -hmm. Aristotle used systoikos geographically for places standing on the same row or coordinate. Now, in our modern language, we would say that would be a line of longitude or latitude. This word denotes lying on a grid in relationship to another place on the grid, on the same row or coordinate. So we have to say Mount Sinai would be on the same line of latitude or longitude as Jerusalem. But it doesn't tell us was that north or south, east or west. We don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just on the same line as Jerusalem. So by using the Greek word, systoikio is it? Yes. Systoikio. Uh, that Paul uses and Aristotle uses it geographically. Yes. We, we know the first part of this is that it's either a line, one, you know, whatever that line East, is. East, west, or north, south, yeah, but okay. on the same line, wherever okay. it is. All right. Also, <clears throat> this was the only use of systoikio in the entire New Testament, just a one use in this verse, mm -hmm. which to me suggests that the Apostle Paul handpicked that word for this particular geographical wordplay in his allegory. He's giving you a clue. It sounds like a good clue to me. Looking at the word anno, it occurs seven times in the New Testament. It means upward or on the top. In our lingo, it would be north. Jerusalem was above Mount Sinai. So hmm. on, a, on a map, on the globe, that would be north. So now we know that they were on the same meridian of longitude, because this is north-south, and that Jerusalem was north of Mount Sinai. Yeah, you can read it there. Mount Sinai in Arabia answereth to, or is in... On the same line. On the same line to Jerusalem, which is above. Exactly. Now, looking at the old city of Jerusalem, the meridian of longitude that passes through is at 35 degrees, 14 minutes. This was the old Temple Mount area here of Jerusalem. If we extend that line straight south from Jerusalem, we see that it extends into the northwest Saudi Arabian area in the region of Midian, and it comes very close to the mountain range of Jebel Laws. But if the mountain is over here... It uh, wouldn't work as well, would it? I mean, yes. So you're suggesting that this longitude line uh, comes all the way through, and it does. It, it's, it's very, very close to this Jebel Makla, Jebel Laws. Yes, Jerusalem answers to Mount Sinai in Arabia, and Jerusalem is above. Mm -hmm. It's just a very simple, and it's so ironic that there seems to be a line there. If we look actually at the area of Jebel Laws range, and here's the same meridian that passes through Jerusalem, 35 degrees, 14 minutes, it's only four miles west of Jebel Laws. Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions about this. The, the Apostle Paul, he obviously knew the scriptures very well. But didn't he go to Mount Sinai, or did he, did he ever travel to this location? He went to Arabia. That's, that's all that we know. He, he exiled to Arabia for a time to study or meditate. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not told where, but... Would that Arabia have been this particular Arabia, Arabia my, Felix? My guess is that he went into Arabia Felix, but... We don't know. We don't know. And, okay. and, it, and it, it doesn't pay to speculate any further, but we do know that 150 or 100 years after Paul wrote that Ptolemy had already established a fairly accurate latitude and longitude system. And actually, I looked at Ptolemy's original longitudes from 100 years after Paul, and his longitude 66, he used a different system, comes right through the same area. And so we know that there was good knowledge as close to 100 years of Paul about the longitude relationships in this area of the world. Okay, I want to just bring something up that's just really curious, is that the, a lot of ancient people were really, really smart. I mean, I know people today that would have no clue 
of how you would establish a longitude line. But here we are thousands of years earlier, and Ptolemy and others were, uh, were doing it, right? Exactly. 1900 years ago, he had a system of longitudes that were marked in various locations in his book called The Geography. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Apostle Paul possibly could have even understood things like geography and, and the study of the stars or, you know, knowing how to map things out? Because I know uh, if we look at when Christ was born, uh, there, were, there were wise men in the East, right, that they were looking at the stars and they were looking at, at astronomical uh, you know, movements of planets and, and stars, and they were, they were gauging things through that. The ancient mind might have looked at the sky an awful lot. And I know that when you're on a ship, uh, or if you're out uh, trying to find where you are, you use a North Star, you use other things to, to navigate at night. There was a lot more wisdom and intelligence in antiquity than we often give credit for. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's important to realize. And the Apostle Paul was the learned of the learned in the Pharisees. And if there was knowledge to be had about geography, especially related to Jewish history, he would have had it. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding and strong suspicion at least that the Jewish people were aware of the location of Mount Sinai still at that point in history. Mm -hmm. And whether this line of longitude came from travelers or actually came from existing Greek geographical estimations that existed at the time of Paul, we're not sure because the closest I can go back with a written record is Ptolemy a hundred years after Paul, but that's pretty close to Paul's 8050 writing of the book of Galatians. Can you summar summarize this up? Well, we're using historical sources to point to the location of Mount Sinai. We've already isolated it to this area near Midian, and this record of Galatians by the Apostle Paul very closely pinpoints where we should look in the region of Midian for his Mount Sinai. The reason I position Midian in this area of northwest Saudi Arabia is because this is a livable area. There's oases in this area that provide water and access to the sea. You can't move Midian further north because the terrain doesn't permit habitation. It's too rough, it's, there's no water, there's uh, poor grazing areas, and this area is livable and habitable in this mountainous terrain further north. You can put the name on the map, but you can't live there. We know that Midian is in this area from historical references by Josephus, Eusebius, and St. Jerome. And we also know it from the Arab geographers that Midian was in this location. They didn't put Midian any farther north than Albad. Mm -hmm. The church historian Eusebius, who lived, well, he died in 340 A.D., and then the theologian St. Jerome, who translated the Vulgate Bible, died in 420 A.D. So these were fairly early scholars. Both of these men placed Midian in Arabia Felix. Midian itself they placed east of the Red Sea in Arabia Felix, and then they placed Mount Sinai in the proximity of Midian. Their writings are very clear on this. Here's a quote from Eusebius regarding the definition of Horeb. Mm -hmm. Now, they were a little confused about the definition of Horeb because they put them on separate mountains, but nonetheless he defined Horeb as the mountain of God in the land of Madium, which was the Greek word for Midian, mm -hmm. it lies beside Mount Sinai, beyond Arabia, and I put in parentheses here Petra, which we'll get to, in the desert. So this Mount Sinai lies beyond Arabia in the desert. But the most important thing is the mountain of God in the land of Midian. And this was stated by both of these historians. And the challenge for, you know, let's say the Sinai Peninsula is that uh, having a mountain there, that isn't the land of Midian, is it? It's not the land of Midian. That throws another complication into that theory. Mm -hmm. Again, applying the definition of Eusebius to the mountain of God and to Mount Sinai, this is a map from 1654 by Sanson, and, and he copied the geography of uh, Ptolemy to a large degree. This map shows Arabia Felix here 
with Midian in the northwest corner of Arabia Felix. Here's Mount Sinai. So this Sinai. yellow section is Arabia Felix? Is that, that was Arabia Felix. Okay. I'm just curious, what is this? This is Arabia Petra, right. which was the land that lay between Arabia Felix and Palestine. So when Eusebius was writing from Caesarea up here in Palestine, he's looking south and he's saying, the mountain the, of God. The Mount Mount Sinai beyond Arabia, boom. The pink stuff. <laughs> in the desert. Mm -hmm. And he'd already defined in another place the location of Midian as being in Arabia Felix. So if he says that the mountain of God in the land of Midian, we already know that the mountain of God is in Arabia Felix because of earlier definitions that he gave in other parts of the geography. It lies beside Mount Sinai, beyond Arabia, referring to this Arabia Petra, as it was later called, in the desert. And so desert is another word for wilderness. If we look at this, I think this is the Gulf of Suez right here, right? That would be the Gulf of Suez. And what we don't have again is we're missing... We're missing the Gulf of Aqaba, yep. and this would be... This little nut right yeah, there. Yeah, this would be a lot. It says Alan. We have a, a mishmash of geography here because of the misunderstanding of the gulfs of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But the important point is Eusebius and St. Jerome, very early in church history, put Mount Sinai and the, Mount, the mountain of God in the land of Midian, and they also put Midian in Arabia Felix. And I think that when we look at people who are suggesting things that were, you know, let's say a thousand years later or uh, 1500 years later, right, or 2000 maybe in this case, but they're still going on at least information or knowledge that they had. And I think that's one of the things that we're looking at is, well, how does that information get passed on through the generations and, and which ones do you listen to and which ones do you say, no, that's that got off the track? Because there were other people who were suggesting that Mount Sinai was in the Sinai Peninsula. Actually, if you look at this map right here, you're saying this might be the Sinai Peninsula. They're showing Mount Horeb here. They're showing Mount Sinai here. Mm. And these are both lying east of the shaft of the Red Sea. Yeah. So and they had that understanding then? They had that understanding even though they didn't have the full geography of the heads of the Red Sea. No, they Red have Catherine sea. here too. And that would be a reference to the St. Catherine, the monastery mm -hmm. built in 530 A.D. Interesting then is that they see Midian here uh, and they see Mount Sinai, not where St. Catherine is. Yes, and that's the confusion about different names for different mountains. Mm -hmm. And Eusebius and Jerome both placed Sinai and Horeb as different locations. Mm -hmm. But this establishes that we should be looking in the region of the land of Midian for Mount Sinai. And what it tells me is that those early church fathers didn't see Mount Sinai at St. Catherine. Well, you have to realize that St. Catherine's really was not established till after the time of Eusebius and Jerome. Hmm. Okay. It didn't exist at the time of Eusebius and but Jerome. But previous to that, and that was Queen Helena that basically sort of put the the emphasis on that and because of her stature? They say that she may have, but there's no evidence that she ever visited the Sinai Peninsula. Okay. And the first monastery was completed in 530 AD from my understanding. And that's well after Eusebius and Jerome. Because I had heard that she had uh, gone to different places. She did. And, and she, she established proclaimed that these were the places monuments and churches, but there's no evidence she ever traveled to the Sinai Peninsula. Hmm. Moving on to another historical document, the Holy See of Jerusalem. This refers to the church politics at the time. The Holy See of Jerusalem wrote a document in A.D. 534, and it was in the document entitled Metropolitan Archiepiscopal and Episcopal Towns in the Sea of the Holy City of Jerusalem. It laid out 24 different locations of sub-bishops or bishoprics in the church. It laid out the politics and the territory of rule that each of these archbishoprics had. This document seemingly placed Mount Sinai in Arabia. E. H. Palmer in The Desert of the Exodus in 1871 had cited this particular 
document from ancient history. In that document, the explanation of Archbishopric number 22, which was at Ela or Elat, it defines Ela as a country on the coast of the Red Sea, we know that, distant from Heropolis, about 150 miles, more to the west than Mount Sinai. So we're defining a lot. It's on the east coast of the Red Sea. It's away from Heropolis, 150 miles. It's more to the west than Mount Sinai, from which it is distant 60 miles. Now let's look at a map. Here is Ela, which would be Aqaba now. Here's Heropolis. And this is uh, ancient Elat, right? Yes. And the document is defining the location of Ela as being 150 miles from Heropolis. So at the head of the Gulf of Suez up here. Yes. 150 miles to Ela. Right. And this Elat is more to the west than Mount Sinai. So the position here would have to be more to the west than where Mount Sinai was located. And so you're, you're theorizing then that if this is Mount Sinai, this Jebel Laws, Jebel Makla area, this mountain fits it, that description. And it also fits because it says that Elat is distant from the mountain by 60 miles. And the air mile distance in modern measurement is 63 miles. Conversely, if we look at the St. Catharines area. Which is the traditional Mount Sinai. Traditional Mount Sinai. The air distance there is 93, and it is west of Elat, whereas the document says that Elat is west of Mount Sinai. And that's the whole point behind this whole exercise in patterns of evidence, is to say, okay, well, here you have some criteria. There's a pattern you have to follow, right? So this is actually identifying that the mountain would have to be as you said, 60 miles east of this area. Yeah, the mountain would be, uh, be east because Elat is more to the west than Mount Sinai, and the distance is 60 miles. Which puts it right up here and over here, but, and it's a distance of 60 miles. Right. Interestingly, in Palmer's book, where he lists this document, he doesn't understand this verse, and in parentheses, he puts question mark east because he thinks that Elat should be east of Mount Sinai. He only knew of this Mount Sinai, so in his book, he actually put in parentheses question mark east, like Elat should be. It is east of the traditional, but it's west of an Arabian Mount Sinai. Yeah. And, and th th once again, then, this tradition had grown to a point where that uh, he wanted to correct what was written. Right. And another entry, which we'll go into in the same document, explains that conundrum. In Bishop Tr Prick 24, which is two entries later, it lists another Mount Sinai. It says, Mount Sinai is an abbey, abbey and Bishop Prick in Arabia Petra, or as it is called, Palestinia Tertia. This was a bishopric even in the time of Justinian, who built the monastery here in 530. So Justinian was the one that built the monastery known as St. Catherine's in 530. What we're seeing here is a dichotomy between the geographical perhaps Jewish identity of Mount Sinai in Arabia and the church hierarchy identity of a Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. And from this point on, the Mount Sinai traditional site in the Sinai Peninsula grew in favor because the church had a bishopric there. They had political power invested there. There was transportation there via the Roman road that happened to go through southern Sinai Peninsula, whereas the Mount Sinai in Arabia was inaccessible, was not under church control, and wasn't readily available for visits by pilgrims. And from this point on, where we see a dichotomy, we see two different Mount Sinai's listed in two different places, this grew to be the Mount Sinai because it was a venue that allowed visitors, it was visible, it had control, and there was church power centered at that place. Mm -hmm. Yes, and for 
uh, centuries. Uh, I mean, that became the place. Well, actually, for 1,500 years almost, right? Yes. Again, we're going over historical reasons to look at a location for Mount Sinai in Northwest Arabia. And this document from 534 points to that idea. So we looked at the map and we are focusing on this area east of the Gulf of Aqaba for the location of Mount Sinai and the route of the Exodus. Looking further at Exodus 3.1 about Moses' trip to the mountain of God, Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. So this gives us a starting place. I situate Moses and Jethro in this coastal area where there were oases, water sources, you had ocean breeze, you had potential for fishing, contact with boats, and a more desirable climate. If you move inland, say, to Abad, you don't have the sea winds, you don't have the water, you don't have potential fishing, mm -hmm. and you have more isolation in effect. This coastal area, I believe, was the focus of habitation of ancient Midian. And in ancient times, I mean, this looks a bit dry and barren right now, but in ancient times, do you think it was more, you know, lush with... Uh... At the time of the Exodus, circa 1500 BC, proxy climate data indicate that the period was unusually wet and cool. And it was that way for several hundred years. Those conditions would favor everything that would be needed for the exodus, pasturing herds, finding more sources of water, and having more tolerable temperatures. Those same conditions were in existence at the time that Moses was in exile in Midian. Mm -hmm. So we know the starting place of Moses' trek to the mountain. It was Midian on the coast. And he led the flock to the backside of the wilderness. We've already discussed the backside of this wilderness, and the process that we've been touching on is called vertical transhumance. That means that the pastoral practice is to go from lower altitudes to higher altitudes to take advantage of vegetation, rainfall, and temperature. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they leave the hot coastal areas to go to the highlands for the summer months. And it's done on an annual basis by the Bedouin. And so this trip to the backside of the wilderness was the flock was for the purpose of vertical transhumance. Moses came to the mountain of God on to Horeb. So in going to the backside of the wilderness, Moses came upon the mountain of God. Now the translation of this verse, traditional, all the traditional translations try to equate Horeb with the mountain of God, but it's a mistranslation. The actual word is not Horeb, it's Horebah. And Horeban in Hebrew means Horeb word. So Moses went Horeb word or toward Horeb to get to the mountain of God. It wasn't that the mountain of God was Horeb. This is a direction that he went. He went toward Horeb where he found the mountain of God. And I've often heard, I mean, obviously after almost 20 years of this, uh, you know, people saying Mount Horeb or you know, Mount Sinai, they were using it the same. Now, this clarifies a lot for me. If, if it was in the region of Horeb, uh, you can see uh, more clearly why that word Horeb was around Rephidim and other places. And you're trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, weren't they over here? But I get it now, you know. And if you think of it as Mount of Horeb, in other words, it was a mountain or a peak of the Horeb region. Mm -hmm. It was the Mount of Horeb, not the Horeb mountain. Yeah. You have to think about the idiom there coming from the Hebrew to the English with that word of. There's no of in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's just written mountain Horeb. And the translators put of in there where it's not often necessary. And sometimes they leave it out where it should be said but it was the mount or the peak of Horeb. Summary for Exodus 3.1, we say that Moses went toward Horeb to reach the mountain of God. He didn't go to the mountain of God called Horeb. And I've indicated on this map the area of Horeb, which seems to 
relate to the area now called Alhisma. Mm -hmm. And so this whole upper plain or plateau, Horeb, 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 you've got this listed as this whole region here is an area of Horeb. I believe Horeb was an arid highland plateau and it would be the area east of the Lip Mountains, which this white line is the eastern beginning of the Lip Mountains, and the Lip Mountains slope to the Hisma, including this area in here. So what's happening is, is that, you know, if you have, you know, on one side is going down to the sea, and the other side is up to this plateau, right? Right. Okay, that gets, and that's this white line right through here. Yes, that's the El Shifa mm -hmm. range, where that range begins to slope towards the Hisma. And in this case, it would be Horeb. Now, the meaning of Horeb is dry or arid. And, of course, the Hisma area, by de definition, is a dry, arid mm -hmm. location. So this word Hisma is what it's called today. Yes. What you're suggesting is, is that they might have called it Horeb in the ancient times. Right. And the meaning of Hisma is uh, in the sense of maybe vague or undefined. The idea of Horeb was also relatively undefined. The Bible says nothing about the eastern extent of Horeb, only that Rephidim and the wilderness of Sinai were in Horeb. Well, what I can tell you too, and what we know is that th off in this direction was was a huge desert. I mean, it was just more open, yeah. wild, uncharted terrain. Yeah. So the hypothesis here, considering the historical data, the geography, the conditions for a mountain, again points to Jebel Makla. And we saw how the meridian of the Apostle Paul came down within four miles of the Jebel Law's peak. Mm -hmm. People are going to say, how could he be so precise in that day and age? I don't know, but there evidently were travelers that were familiar with the area, and particularly if the Jewish knowledge of the location of Mount Sinai still existed, that there would be some concern about its actual location, how you got there, and, and how it related. And we do know that there was early charting of latitude and longitude near the time of the Apostle Paul. Well, that's why I was wondering if there was a more uh, looking at, from an astronomical standpoint, that they were looking at the North Star and different stars at different times of the year to kind of get a feeling for bearing. And who knows, but I'm just... Yes, we, we don't know, but I, I think they're smarter than what we give them credit for. Well, obviously, uh, yeah. Hey, Glenn? Yes? Do you, wanna, do you have off the top of your head, didn't the Greeks uh, estimate the circumference of the Earth to a very accurate level? Um, actually... Uh, Ptolemy way underestimated the circumference of the, the earth and that's why Columbus sailed west okay. to get to the East Indies because he thought it was a lot shorter distance okay. than what it really was. Yes, and uh, Ptolemy used the Canary Islands for his zero meridian and then he worked west from or east from there with his longitudes but he way underestimated the circumference of the earth. And ironically, the mapping that Columbus relied on was based on Ptolemy's work, and it was inaccurate, but think 1500 AD or 1490 or whatever, they're still using stuff from the yeah. age of the Greeks and the Romans because they had nothing else. Best yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and that's the same reason you have the throwback to the traditions about Mount Sinai and the sea crossing. It, it, it was old knowledge, but it was all the knowledge they had. Nothing mm -hmm. had been updated. Having looked at the potential location for Mount Sinai in Arabia, 